Here we are back again with another podcast. Who knew it would take so long? Uh, on the heels of a almost decade hiatus from podcasting, I'm bringing you Brento Cast live from the cradle here above Albemarle Nutrition, 1711 East Main Street. Um, getting back to a little bit of direct content from the horse's mouth, so to speak, on all things. Johnny Brento, a.k.a. Brent Bowers, here to update you on the what's what after a long time away. Um, I'm going to have a set format for these. This won't be that today because it's a little bit off the cuff. Decided just to, hey, start this based on some inspiration by a friend's podcast that I started watching. And I was like, wow, you know, I have everything in place to do this. I have my sweet studio space set up. I can make it looks or sound any way I like to. So... I think I can do this in a somewhat effortless man manner, and, and I hope to start doing that and uh, packing these away for uh, nostalgic reasons, really. I'm a nostalgic guy, you know. I like to look back at things I've done in the past and see where my head was at with relation to art and music proje projects, and um, there's no real repository of all those things. I have a few fairly large Facebook pages for different hobbies and uh, subject, like my music Facebook page, which covers all of my... Uh, live performances and releases that's um facebook.com slash brent bowers music of course and uh, you can just search brent bowers music and find that right there on facebook um and then i have a variety of other fan sites and slash they used to be called fan pages um disciple 3d um dash 360 dash studio comics all of these are on Facebook. You can search them out. But really, the the main site to go to for all things Brent-related, myself, is my website, brentbowers.com. I've held that uh, website in its current format, uh, changing themes to my WordPress uh, interface. But uh, 17 years now, 18 years, I think, I've had that site online. So there's stories going back to, like, 2003. So um, it's pretty interesting to look back for myself because it's like a – a living diary that I just keep adding to. And now that I've had this amazing change in my life where I have a granddaughter and she's now about to turn three on July the 11th, um, I produce a lot of content with regards to home video. I try to edit. I try to have at least 20 minutes of edited footage every week dedicated to her. And you can find that on the front page of brentbowers.com in my weekly vlogs. In addition to that, I am now... Once again, producing content for VHS Graveyard, which you can find as well on uh, Facebook. You can see a little bit of that here behind me, but I'm going to start back. I've uh, neglected the VHS collecting hobby for quite some time for a couple of reasons. Um, the final placement of the VHS Graveyard itself was in question for a long, long time, and I just felt, I don't know, a little bit off presenting it where it was in kind of a tiny, tight room in these little blockbuster racks that... You really couldn't see all that there was to see at a glance. And you still don't see that here. Uh, for those of you watching the video, you still don't see that here. Um, you're just seeing a section of it. And, and even this, even though this room is the final location for it, these self-made racks are not. And so I hope to have it categorized and in much nicer cabinets that are sort of on the recording studio side and facing. We're going to go with partitions, I think, to, to break up the space. It's a 1,000 square feet in this room, so... It's, it's a lot, and for the studio, you need smaller space than that sometimes just to control reverb and whatnot. So uh, uh, who knows what this space will ultimately be. Right now, it's a lot of things. It's our prep area for the store. It's our break room. It's a, a large portion of it is dedicated to uh, a playhouse and two ginormous dollhouses, lots of Barbie stuff, uh, kids' drum kit, kids' instruments, multiple riding vehicles, a sliding board, a hanging tent, a chalkboard, a uh, dedicated TV for her, giant toy trunks, toy racks. I mean, we are we are about the Delilah, and that's the way it's going to be, at least for the next foreseeable future. And that's a good thing. But um, but I'm back to the point where I want to do some some other little things here, and uh, and even to highlight content from that world, uh, you know, on my my other outlets. Um, it's a great thing to kind of get back to. Uh, doing a podcast and sort of a personal podcast you're going to hear family content you're going to hear content about all things that i am interested in and i make the promise that i will never ever spend more than one minute per podcast talking about anything remotely political or um 
just the stuff that you're going to hear uh, everywhere else, right? Like, why, why, why talk about coronavirus here? There's, there's none of that, you know. And even that word, just I, I wish I hadn't even said that. I'm probably going to bleep that word because it's, it's a dirty word, and, and you know, coming out of my mouth. And I just, I don't care about hearing that word anymore because it's a. Con- Actually, I've noticed a lot of other podcasters and uh, YouTube folks uh, calling it something else. And you know, now you can't say the. The G-U-N word, you say pew pew, and there's all these things that prevent YouTube from striking down your video, and um, I'll incorporate as much of that as, as I care to learn, which is not very much. Frankly, I don't do any of this for for the hits and the views. If you find some enjoyment in it, that's great. Um, I'm happy when people listen to it, but on the flip side of that, I would still want to make it even if no one listened to it but myself, because I think there's going to be a future time. Uh, where, of course, I've, I leave this world and, you know, folks that I leave behind me might be interested in hearing, you know, what old Johnny Brento was doing at age 52 and see some of his projects and, you know, who knows, maybe not, but I'd like to believe someone would be out there that cares about that content. So, moving right along, how about the movie, man? Uh, I will say uh, probably my favorite movie experiences. Well, actually, it's not even close. My favorite movie experience of the last year, uh, you know, as we started to uh, edge back into uh, going to the movies in person after the you-know-what, um, my favorite by a country mile is uh, Top Gun because the filmmakers actually took the time to consider what folks might want to to see in a movie. And I think that's the most brilliant thing about it, really. Uh, without getting into, into any of the politics, there was zero uh, service to the message, uh, to quote the critical drinker. Um, zero uh, virtue signaling that I could tell. Um, they really, you know, George Corman's uh, famously, you know, a producer who's produced, you know, probably hundreds of movies and never supposedly lost a nickel in Hollywood. He always says, if you want to have a successful sequel, just make the first film again. And in many ways, they did that with Top Gun Maverick. Um, There was a lot of fan service to nostalgia with the original cast members, and I thought that was amazing seeing those folks. Um, But then, of course, you know, uh, the love interest was a completely different actress, Jennifer Connelly, who, let me just say, God bless her mom and dad. Because that girl was blessed with some good genetics, and she has taken care of herself, and she looks amazing for her age. As does Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise, um, as a as a, a filmmaker, man, that guy is he is really really up there with producing good pro, uh, projects. And the man's taking you know he's got a lot of means, and he's he's put a lot of that into keeping himself looking good. And uh, uh, another guy that he's like, I think, 60 now, uh, unbelievable shape for 60, can still run. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, they didn't go over the top with trying to make him seem like he was 30. You know, that film was 35 years ago, the original. So uh, the character aged along with uh, the story, and it was it was age appropriate. There, there was a nebulous enemy that I sort of think was kind of a stand-in for Russia with the whole... Uh, you know what thing invasion of you know where and um don't want to pay that any lip service whatsoever uh it was just enough to make you feel patriotic which is something that hollywood hopefully will catch on to um you know are we the nicest country in the world maybe not but you know there is a such thing as truth and justice and there's still uh, places in the world where you can't get that and you get a whole lot of it here even though maybe not everybody gets it but like there's a whole lot of it and that's going to click off 10 seconds on the uh, political minute. But, um, yeah, I, I think that these filmmakers realize that, you know, it would be nice for a change to not, you know, see death to America. Uh, you know, w- w- the main, you know, hero of our show screaming how we're all terrible and, you know, deserve to be engulfed in flame and <laughs> left a smoldering pile of ashes. I don't know, man. It's like, of course, I'm talking about the boys, that program, my gosh, man, the filmmakers just went out of their way to target anyone that didn't think just like the writers and say, this is not for you, fat old white guy. <laughs> okay, whatever, dude. I mean, if I'll watch it as long as it amuses me, and the instant that it doesn't, you know, I'll forget about you guys too. I uh, would not recommend subscribing to um, a particular streaming service just to watch that if you happen to have it. It's entertaining. The visual effects are awesome. Awesome, and Carl Urban is great, man. That dude is solid and everything. I've en- I've enjoyed that show to a degree, but the uh, the lip service to social justice has kind of made that uh, you know not the greatest show for me to watch. Dink. <laughs>
<laughs> tipped another, ticked another five seconds off of the political minute there. Um, so, without reservation, I saw the uh, I saw um, Top Gun Maverick while on vacation at the Grand uh, Strip Mall. I, it's not a strip mall. It's the Grand something. The word Grand. At North Myrtle Beach, basically. Go to North Myrtle Beach and search for cinemas. I wish I could have told you because it's in a big mall, and that's something in our area that you don't see anymore. I mean, wow, North Carolina used to be like the hub with some ginormous malls like Eastland Mall and uh, these amazing structures with ice skating rinks and giant arcades in them. And I mean, there's still a little bit of that, but for the most part, there's no big box retailers anymore uh, since Amazon. So, you know, your Belks and your uh, Roses and stores like that are really going out. So, you don't get a chance to see these things, and uh, that I, I lamented the fact, and I actually had planned to go back another day and just walk around that mall to, just to see that whole experience again. Because, uh, you know, a kid from growing up in the '80s and '70s and '80s for me, uh, that's just nostalgic gold. I love that. But uh, the cinema down there, I believe it was maybe a Regal Cinema. It was sit back in the uh, the old lounge chairs situation, and that was a great way to watch the film. It was pre-assigned seating, which I'm not generally a, a big fan of because you end up sitting with strangers, but in the case of that thing with your legs up, I mean, who cares, man? It was nice. Um, so saw that there. Fantastic presentation. A nice little message from Tom Cruise and the filmmakers right at the beginning of it. Uh, you know, just saying, hey, you know, this is this movie had to be seen in the theaters, and thank you for coming, and you know, please enjoy this because we made it for you, you know. And I thought that was a that was a nice little uh, nice little add on, and uh, you know, made me feel good that the effort had been made to hold this and not just release it while everything was like stream at home, stream at home. And they're like, heck no, this movie has to be seen in a theater. And I would agree, man. It would not be the same experience. All the flying. Let's just talk for a second about the. Uh, the visuals, uh, very, very little CG. Now, there was some CG help, you know, like little uh, clouds and, of course, gunfire and things of that nature and explosions. But as far as the uh, visuals of the planes flying, that was largely real planes. And I understand they made some special camera rigs on a, a, a plane that just did a, got a lot of those shots. But uh, just like in the first film, uh, incredible aerial dogfight footage, probably the best now that there is out there. Um, the... Uh, same, lo some of the same uh, locations ship-wise it looked like from the original. Uh, probably wasn't the same ship, but it certainly looked like some of the same uh, locations you would have seen around the action scenes. Of course, uh, it involves some canyon flying and that sort of thing, which the first film didn't, which was kind of neat, you know, neat, neat for a, a different uh, a different challenge, but like some extreme accuracy with uh, munitions was was exhibited and... Um, and then just a little bit of on-foot action, too, which was kind of cool. And, you know, throughout the whole thing, the film doesn't take itself too seriously. I mean, serious subject matter, people, you know, people die in the film, so that's, that's kind of heavy. But um, that's kept to the bad guys in this film, spoiler alert, so that's pretty cool. Um, nobody on the main team, unlike in the first film, you know, with Goose uh, being killed, uh, his, his uh, uh, I guess, tactical officer that does the radar stuff, I forget the name of that, um, that was sort of a major driver in the first film uh, for the protagonist. But um, in this film, it's just uh, someone having a near miss, which was kind of nice because I feel like maybe the filmmakers, they wanted everything to be kind of like on a high note and to get you up there and you walk away going, man, that's how a movie's made. And that's exactly what it did. I mean, I just had such positive feelings about watching a movie in a theater again. And that's the first time for me that happened since the you know what and the you know the two years of you know what so <laughs> you know that was fun um so that was my favorite by far film another film that i really liked a whole lot was um the uh and typically i'm at 52 i'm sort of moving away of my interest in this type of film and marvel has had some kind of misdirection i think social issues ding that's another five seconds off the political minute um, have driven them to do quite a bit of virtue signaling and putting some characters in that were just such minor characters. I mean, you know, representation is important, but virtue signaling and uh, tokenism, I can do without it. And I think most of us, even those groups that are being, you know, virtue signaled to, don't seem to like it. So, um, you know, you can call me a fat white guy, old white guy all you want, but, you know, when your comic with this character fails, you want to spin it as being, like, the patriarchy stopping it, 
And I'm like, well, the patriarchy doesn't buy comics to start with, you know. So that's obviously a straw man right there. But right now, man, the content, there's so much to watch. There's a lot of great Indian productions out there. So I'm, I'm definitely going to check out RRR as it came highly recommended by the guys over at Corridor Digital. So I'm going to check that out. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, there's just there's so much to see. Seeing anything that I know I'm, I'm not going to follow through with, it's, it's not something that I that I like to uh, waste too much time on. But I digress. Um, I haven't even told you the name of the film yet, and I'm going off on this tangent. Um, it's the new, the new Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness. If you liked uh, the last Spider-Man film, then obviously you got to watch this one. And uh, the visuals in it are really good. Now, are there some issues with it? Yeah, but I'll, I'll leave it up to people like uh, much better than me that telling you why there's mistakes made. Uh, I watched the Critical Jinkers uh, movie reviews a lot, and, and I think he was kind of spot on with this one, except for, I would say, apart from his critiques, there is a certain amount of fun that is derived from just going into a theater and seeing a giant spectacle on the screen of all these Lovecraftian lore-type monsters being pop brought into the Marvel Universe and characters that you are you are familiar with, even though they're trying to, <laughs> they try to twist it in a weird sort of way. Um there is a certain entertainment to be derived from that. And for me, I really enjoyed that. Uh, now, I'm just going to... We're kind of getting running long, a little bit long here for episode one, but I will just cap off that I did go see Lightyear. Pixar, I mean, they're such geniuses with their animation. Again, it looked absolutely amazing. But I did feel uh, that I wouldn't have brought my granddaughter to it had I known all the content in it. And we ultimately got up and left a little bit early. Not because of the content, more because of she got some sugar somehow, so she was getting a little bit wild. But um, I will probably watch that online at some point just to kind of finish it and to see what all the hubbub was about. But again, no kind of sexual uh, education or um, content is appropriate for kids of that age. Uh, just like it wouldn't be appropriate to show them how to manufacture gunpowder or how to you know, engineer a nuclear weapon. You know, gender-related stuff is not appropriate for uh, for kids two and three. So, you know, I mean, uh, sooner or later we're going to learn this one way or the other. And it's not going to be solved with gun control. It's going to be solved with, you know, proper child-rearing. And there's the last of my political minute. <laughs> I promise I'm going to do less of that in the future. I just want to close out with saying it's good to be back. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus this show, and I'm going to have some set-up segments and hopefully at some point I can have a guest or two that I might be working with uh, because there's music projects that I didn't even get into. Episode two, I'm going to talk about what I am doing with myself musically these days and you know who, 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 I'm, who I'm involving in that. And uh, there are some specific projects and also some specific gigs. As of right now, uh, I don't have the actual date, but I think it's the last weekend or the next to last weekend um, in July we'll be back out playing live at Loafers and Legends in Baden, and I will get the specifics of that. And, you know, obviously sharing my live performance dates uh, will be a big thing uh, on these shows. There'll be a segment where I update you on that. But, you know, between now and then, if you want to check out Brent Bowers' music on Facebook, you can do so. Um, and as always, you can find me at brentbowers.com. Thanks for checking out Episode 1. There will be more coming soon. Thanks, guys, and uh, hope you stick around for a little bit of this.